To begin with, I'd like to acknowledge that our speakers tonight are living and working on the lands of the Bunwarang and the Woiwurrung people of the Eastern Kulin Nation and pay my respects to Elders past, present and emerging. Welcome to Why Models Work, the Dinosaur Edition. It's the next in our series, which focuses on the Mini Mega Model Museum exhibition at Melbourne Museum. Now, it's disappointing that we can't go and visit the museum at the moment. We can't walk around the exhibition and have a look at it right now. However, we do have a solution. We've got a virtual tour um, available and you should have received a link in your lecture registration. Um, and it does give you a really nice view of the exhibit, so um, do check it out. My name is Kate Phillips and I'm a senior curator in the sciences department and with colleagues uh, Kimberly Moulton and Rebecca um, Carland, I coordinate the MV lecture series, um, which brings our experts from Melbourne Museum Science Works and the Immigration Museum into your home. Um, we're delighted to be able to continue this uh, series via Zoom webinars as part of our museum at home. If you're new to the format, uh, it's not like a Zoom meeting. Let me reassure you, we can't see whether you're wearing dinosaur pyjamas. You're just in the privacy of your own home. But we would love you to, um, to get involved by sending in questions. Um, if you hover your cursor over the screen, uh, some icons will pop up and one of those is a Q&A box and you can type your questions in there. Um, and um, at the end of the presentation, um, we'll, be, we'll have time to um, answer those questions. So I'll read them out and our panel can answer them and discuss them. Now I'd like to introduce you to our first speaker, the Curator of Engineering, Matilda Vaughan, who's worked on the, with the Society and Technology Collections since 2010. Over the last couple of years, Matilda has been working with the exhibition team that created the, Mina, the Mini Mega Model Museum exhibition. In the last lecture, we heard about her rest, the restoration of the historic working models case, which was really perhaps uh, a classic engineering challenge um, feeding directly into her engineering background. Um, but tonight, this talk focuses on very different subject matter. Um, because also in this diverse exhibition, we have three quite unusual dinosaur models in that they span over a 150 year uh, pe uh, time period. So Matilda will give us an overview of the exhibition and show us where these models fit in. Uh, we really like to bring together different disciplines in the museum and um, Matilda will show us that there is a link between engineering and paleontology. So over to you, Matilda. Thank you, Kate. Um, I'll do my best. <laughs> Hi everyone, I'm Matilda Vaughan, the curator of the Mini Mega Model Museum exhibition, and I'm just going to be giving you a, a very uh, general introduction to the to the exhibition. So this is how the, the entry to the exhibition looked just before we opened on the 7th of December last year. Um, when we first began thinking about this exhibition and what it could be and looking at the models and miniature things in our collections, a question that was always on my mind was, why did this model get made? And for museum models that have a scientific focus, the reasons are usually to demonstrate how something works or to, to show how something looks and uh, to provide some kind of a three-dimensional feel to a wider story, perhaps about biodiversity or habitats or our natural resources. But, but that's not how they've been presented in the Mini Mega Model Museum. The focus has changed to highlight an alternative aspect and that's primarily their relationship to scale. And alongside that, there's the inspiration of the model maker or the techniques or materials that they have used or the places and under what circumstances the models were made. The objects all offer some insight into the various reasons why we as humans may choose to remake the world around us at different scales. 
And the models invite you to look closer, to look at their details, and it may perhaps even provoke thoughts about the way your, famili your familiarity with or your unintentional bias affects how you observe things and what you think about particular objects. The exhibition space has three areas. There's an area for the objects that are smaller than in real life, an area for where they're the same size, and another for those where they've been enlarged. And the spaces are also designed to make you think about your relationship to scale. So you feel like a relative giant amongst the undersized things. You feel your usual size, but in an unusual environment with the same size things. And you should be feeling tiny amongst the oversized things. So in the area where the things are undersized or smaller or miniaturized compared to real life, we ask, why would someone make these things so small? And as you move through that area, you do get to see some prompts that can offer a reason. Then there's another area where the things are the same size, and, but arranged in a way that you might not be quite expecting to see them. And, and this is where we're asking, how do you make models look so deliciously real? And here we're thinking about how nature identical finishes and features are made. And then there's the area where the very tiny things have been made much bigger. And this is where we're asking and thinking about how making something bigger can perhaps change the way we see the world around us. And uh, is there an inherent beauty in the things that are not usual, not usually visible to us? And so uh, back to the start of the exhibition. So when you enter the exhibition, you'll see the three models over here that Dr. Tom Rich will be speaking more about here over to the left. And they're in a little group of their own and offering a reflection on why someone would make something smaller. And if you linger long enough in this area, you can hear vertebrate paleontologist Tim Ziegler's voice talking about them too. So th they are part of the evolving story about how new ideas get shared and reimagined and reinterpreted as new information is revealed. So just pausing at the first of these models, this, this model is a model of a life-size model. And, and the person who made this model and also the life-size model was Benjamin Waterhouse Hawkins. And he didn't just make one because this was an opportunity to reach many people and as a public education resource, a visual form of learning that could reach out to those who did not live close enough to visit the real thing, his real life models. And although not made on a scale of a mass, like a mass produced souvenir, models like these were also replicated by others and marketed to wealthy naturalists in the 19th century. And museums and university also acquired them. So he was commissioned to make a life-size menagerie of the newly discovered extinct animals. And these were arranged in a life-size landscape diorama as part of the geological gardens of the Crystal Palace precinct that was created in 1853 in London. And to create them, he consulted with the prominent paleontologists such as Richard Owen and examined all the available evidence. And he applied the same method of making a small model to making the life-size version. And it can be difficult for people to see animals from just their bones, so you can understand how he wanted to fire up the imagination of scientists and the general public too. And you can see this is the iguanodon model uh, or the life-size drawing of the, the one that we've got in the, in the exhibition. So he, he made, he, first he made sketches and then drawings and then small clay sculptures before sculpting the life-size version in clay around a core of bricks and stones and cement that were bound with uh, iron hoops. And from that he made a plaster mould, which you can see part of down here in, in sections, and then he poured concrete into the moulds to cut to create the cast. And the, this iguanodon plaster mould was also used for a celebratory dinner where he and uh, 21 of his closest collaborators and friends sat inside it and around it on New Year's Eve in 1853. The models were well used as teaching aids and so over time they had acquired the patina of having been touched by many hands. And so to display them um, uh, for our exhibition, our conservators cleaned and treated them to repair the cosmetic defects 
that would detract from their appearance, such as the chips that you see on the nose here, and there are other sort of things missing. Um, and there's also an original label on this one, and that's unfortunately not legible, but from what you can see, it does show that the model is likely to be one of the ones that was made by Waterhouse Hawkins himself. And in this, uh, over our 1888, in our 1888, 1880s version of the dinosaur, it had lost three of its claws and it would give the wrong impression if they were absent. So you can see there's one missing here and two missing there. And this is the, where they've been um, uh, added back in. Uh, this is uh, also important for having the model for be self-supporting and so that it, it just, it's stable in it, it, when, you, when it's in, uh, on, on display. And now I want to take you over to show you a more modern paleontology model. But on the way, I just want to detour briefly to this model in the undersized model area. So in this exhibition, you'll, all, you'll find models like this 20th century mechanical dinosaur. It was donated by the State Electricity Commission of Victoria and appeared in a display about the energy resources of the Latrobe Valley in 1955. A machine just like this one has a connection to fossils. This is the real life machine working at the coalface. So a, a, an operator working on a machine like this uncovered fossilized remains of ancient kangaroos while they, while they were working on the coalface of the Morwell open cut mine in southeastern Victoria in the early 1970s. And those kangaroo fossils remains were collected in the 70s and are now also in the museum's collection. And it can be hard to imagine how an operator managed to see the first bone that was uncovered by such a big machine. And you can see over here, you can see two operators standing here in, um, to get a sense of the scale of the machine. So paleontology today still uses models and both, the, both those that are made in the traditional way of using moulds to produce casts or digitally printed in 3D. And in this showcase, you can see a replica cast of a fossilised whale skull and jaw. And if you linger long enough here, you'll also hear the voice of Dr. Eric Fitzgerald, a vertebrate paleontologist, talking about it. Now, this model was created by CT scanning each of those fossil fragments and assembling all those X-ray slices into a computer program and stitching them together to produce a 3D image but it still involves some educated guesswork. For, for example, the blue bits show areas where that were recreated because they were missing or not preserved in the rocks. And here you can see a close-up of the texture of the fossil bone that's been captured, but, but there are limits to the resolution that can be physically achieved. And it doesn't replace, uh, entirely replace looking at or feeling the real thing. And note also the join along here. The model was printed in two parts and then glued together. So ha having a physical copy of the fossil is helpful because it allows scientists to pick it up, touch it and compare its form to other fossils. And the original fossil here on the, on the right, um, there's the original fossil plus one of the jaw bones there was only one jawbone and so in the absence of further information the other was created just as this, uh, to be symmetrical with the with the original and so we've got here two representations of alfred's skull the one that was put together the traditional way by assembling the parts and um, the modern 3d digital way and over time scientists may find further information that may help them reinterpret those fossils and models again So models can be viewed as a tangible bookmark for a moment in time and also be a conduit for re-evaluation of those ideas and perspectives over time. So there's been a bit of an addition to the exhibition since we first opened. So that's where I'll leave it. I'll just stop sharing my screen. Thank you so much for tuning in. I hope you are able to visit the exhibition when the museum is open again, and I look forward to hearing your questions at the end. So thank you, Kate, passing back to you. Great, thank you, Matilda. 
I really want to go back and have another look at some of those uh, uh, models in the collection in, uh, on display right now. Um, now we go to Dr. Tom Rich, who is Senior Curator of Vertebrate Paleontology. And he's worked in Museums Victoria since 1974. His focus has been on early mammals and dinosaurs, and he's advanced our understanding of vertebrate evolution in Victoria, revealing unique Southern Hemisphere animals, such as the Gondwanan polar dinosaurs. He's been a keen communicator, and as well as talks and exhibitions, he's written many books for the public, in addition to his scientific publications. Tonight, he's going to tell us about the history of how these three very different models of the dinosaur Iguanodon came to be made. To overcome some technical hurdles, we pre-recorded Tom's talk, uh, and after the talk, uh, Tom will join us live to answer your question. Good evening. This talk is centered around three models that the museum has accumulated over about 170 years of the same dinosaur. And why are there three models? It's because our ideas about this dinosaur have fundamentally changed for a number of reasons. And what I'll try to do this evening is to tell you the mental processes that people were going through as these ideas changed, along with the discovery of more complete material, which was the two worked together to create this panoply of three different ways of interpreting the same dinosaur. Now what is the dinosaur? It's a dinosaur that is called Iguanodon, and it was named by the fellow on the uh, left there, or the right, Gideon Mantell, and he and his wife Mary were traveling in the rural area of England around uh, Sussex in, eight, in the summer of 1822. And it's not quite clear who f spotted them, but one of them spotted some shiny um, teeth in the road metal of the recently paved road they were going on. And they picked them up and realized, oh, these are interesting fossils. Now, Gideon had had an interest in uh, fossils for quite some time. And uh, so he struggled with, well, what are these things? And at the time he found them, the fossils' teeth were rather large for the time in which the, um, the age of these fossils. Now, at that time, the geological col column as we think of it wasn't, hadn't been created. So the fossils were in what he called the secondary period. And this was before the age of mammals, which was the tertiary period. And so this was rather anomalous. These were big teeth. And um, well, what were they? And finally, he went to the Ontarian Museum, and a curator there showed him the jaw of a uh, iguana. Much smaller animal, but the kind of animal that he thought it might have something to do with. In other words, it was probably a herbivore, like this uh, iguana that's down on the lower left image there. And um, so he named it Iguana Don when he finally got around to publish it in 1825. But before he did, he sent the specimens to Paris, where the doyen of vertebrate paleontology by the name of Georges uh, Cuvier was resident, and he looked at them, and his initial thought was, these look like rhinos. And so uh, he went back and forth about this for a while, but finally um, Cuvier acknowledged that, yes, these are reptiles, they are not uh, mammals after all. So in uh, 1825, he finally published it on the basis of the teeth you see in this image in the center of this here. So that was nice, but uh, what, what did the animal look like that bore these teeth? And that was the question that uh, Mantell pursued when, he, when better material was found. And about uh, 1834, nine years after he published it, this partial skeleton was found near Maidstone in um, England. And he made this sketch of what he thought the animal looked like. And the, um, this was the first attempt at trying to reconstruct one of these animals um, as, as the skeleton might have appeared. And one of the things he did that was most interesting was he put this little um, one particular bone on the nose of the animal 
and at the time he thought it was a horn. And later, when a model was made of this, the horn appeared right there. Well, it turned out in the end it wasn't a horn at all, but that's part of the story and we'll get to it. Maidstone is very proud of their iguanodon, having the first skeleton. It came from the uh, limestone quarry that's uh, sketched in the uh, left there. And if you look on the Maidstone uh, coat of arms, you'll see an iguanodon on the left side. So they take great pride in their, their uh, dinosaur. But the actual specimen was purchased by uh, Mantell, who hurried to the site when he learned of it. He bought it for 25 pounds and gave it to the Natural History Museum in London, where it's still on display. Mantell was a popularizer of geology as well as writing uh, technical papers. And he, in 1839, he published a book called The Wonders of Geology. And there is a frontispiece in it called The World of the Iguanodon. And this whole idea of the horn on the tip of the uh, skull uh, was perpetuated in that image that was painted by an artist by the name of uh, John Man Ma Martin. So the idea was carried forth that this was possibly the horn on a um, on the iguanodon. Three years later, in 1842, Sir Richard Owen coined the word dinosaur, and he did it on three very incomplete uh, dinosaurs known then from England that had been named in the last 15 years. Two of them by Mantell, and one of them by an, another paleontologist by the name of Buckland. And he basically did this because, A, they were from the secondary, they were big, the uh, vertebrae of the uh, back connected to the pelvis with, three ver with uh, five vertebrae, not a uh, fewer number. And also, the other thing was that the forelimbs particularly indicated that the animal held the uh, limbs directly under the body instead of sprawling out like you see in a turtle or a crocodilian or a lizard today. So this was the, the reason the group was named by Owen on this very slight amount of evidence. And this is the uh, beginning of Iguanodon being a dinosaur. Um, about 10 years later, there was a major exhibition in uh, London, uh, the Great Exhibition of 1851. And it lasted for only about six months. But then it, when it was closed down, what happened was that the Crystal Palace, which was a central focus of it, was uh, dismantled and moved from Hyde Park to where it had been to a, a locality called Bromley. Well, by that time, this idea that there were some large dinosaurs in England was uh, current among the general populace, and among them was the Prince Consort, uh, Prince Albert, the uh, husband of Queen Victoria. And he had the idea that, why don't we make models, life-size models, of some of these prehistoric animals, including the dinosaurs. And what happened was that this idea was taken up, and a artist by the name of Waterhouse Hawkins, who's shown here on the right, was hired to actually construct these models. These, basically, they were concrete models. And in uh, New Year's Eve, 1859, he had a banquet. And he took the lower part of the model and he uh, seated 12 people at it to have a, a festive occasion on the, near the completion of these because they went on display in 1854. Now, this model here that the museum has is the first one. And it's the oldest one. It's 1854. And it was made by Waterhouse Hawkins. He was a professional uh, sculptor and a professional painter. He did a lot of natural history but he was trying to make a living, and so he was selling these. So this one was probably bought just about the same year this museum was established, 1854. These models still exist. What happened was that the Crystal Palace burned down in the, 18, in the 1930s, but the models are still there, and these are the two of Iguanodon. And you can see, for example, the, the large forelimbs on uh, one of them in the background, and the fact that the, they're posed underneath the body. Now, at this point, there was a discussion between um, Owen on one hand, Mantell on the other, and then later paleontologists, did they have small forelimbs or large forelimbs? 
and this went on uh, through the 1870s. Crossing the Atlantic, the story goes to the f discovery of the first dinosaur skeleton that was actually ever mounted. This is uh, a mount of Hadrosaurus falconi, which is found in New Jersey in the green sands there. And it was described by Joseph Leidy, who is a physician and paleontologist. And it's very similar to the duck dinosaurs, which I've included a restoration of one. But below that, you can see what uh, Leidy had to work with. He had the forelimbs, the hind limbs, partially, and he's got a, got a bit of the pelvis and the um, vertebra. This was the first um, skeleton of a dinosaur ever put on display anywhere, and it drew a, a big audience uh, to the uh, Philadelphia Academy of Science. And it was basically a way to try to raise the revenue of the organization because uh, they, they needed the money and uh, this is the way they got it. Anyway, Waterhouse Hawkins was actually uh, commissioned to construct this and the uh, image on the left is his workshop when this was partially underway. Moving forward to 1878, going to Belgium. Near the town of Bernsart, there was a coal mine occurred and in that coal mine, at the depths between about 250 and about 330 meters, a number of skeletons were found, about 35. And this is what the coal mine looked like at, at that time. And then going underground, you had a section like this. And in the um, colored areas, you can actually see where the level of the uh, bones occurred. And, and they were encountered at various drives they put into this uh, coal deposit. Now the coal was actually um, much older, it was carboniferous, but there had been a fissure and the fissure had been filled with uh, debris and in that fissure were these uh, skeletons. And So it was Louis Dolo was the primary um, person who was responsible for the, supervising the collection and then the preparation and the scientific analysis of these fossils. And what they did was underground they would map them as these are uh, quarry maps of various skeletons that were found there. And they would take them to the surface and then uh, reconstruct them. Now by this time they had a good idea that this was an animal which was basically bipedal, that's like shown on this uh, diagram. And Dolo said, oh this looks like a kangaroo. So he modeled the, his interpretation of it was as a kangaroo. And this is where this model here is an outcome of that way of thinking, which really gets started well established about 1880. And it really continues for a century. And the only reason that it didn't continue was that people were continued to think about these fossils. Not only this one, but also the, the duckbill dinosaurs of the type that Leidy had originally um, mounted the first one. And in 1970, a uh, paleontologist looked again at the skeleton of these animals, which were much more complete by this time. And what he found out was that the backbone of these animals from above the pelvis to well into the tail was a rigid rod. It wasn't flexible. And so the tail was actually held out more or less straight. It couldn't be bent the way that um, Dolo hypothesized when he mounted the specimens uh, from, from Birdsart. So in order to make them a kangaroo-like animal, they had to bend away from the body in this direction, like is shown here. Instead of um, the reconstruction of the hadrosaur, they would drive it straight into the, this platform here. So there was a problem that had to be uh, thought about and how you actually pose the animal. So that red arrow indicates the most obvious example of the Bernsart specimens where they literally broke the tail and had the two sections of vertebrae like that when they should have been continuous. So this work was done by uh, Dr. Dave Norman who's uh, now at Cambridge and uh, he in 1980 reviewed the Bernsart specimens. But it also turns out that uh, there are some very intriguing differences about the forelimbs of these animals as well. This diagram of, from Norman shows the evidence that 
uh, the Burnside specimens did not have a, a tail that was flexed in the way that this specimen is. They had to be straight out. And these are the two species that he recognized in the Burnside quarry. There's a Burnside, uh, Iguanodon Burnsartetus and Iguanodon mantelli. But the other thing was that he shows uh, diagrammatically the vertebrae in the upper right-hand corner with all these tendons, the latticework of tendons. And this is the evidence that these animals could not flex that part of the vertebrae. Or in other words, the part of the vertebrae from, from about here to here were a rigid rod. They, weren't, they couldn't bend like uh, was required for the um, restoration that uh, Dolo made. So the thinking was, well, we'll have to repose these again. And so this has um, uh, resulted in this uh, comparison here. The specimen on the left is a hadrosaur, it's a guanodon, and you can see that it's got three prominent uh, toes in the center of the forelimb, and then two uh, that stick out laterally. And it's quite different from the hadrosaurs, which are the closest um, relative among them, which have a much more gracile forelimb, and, they, and the uh, lateral digits do not stick out at all, and there's only two primary ones instead of three. So that the actual way they used these was quite different, and that the iguanodon actually probably was more quadrupedal because those three digits uh, on the forelimb in the center are much more um, robust than in the uh, hadrosaur. So this is uh, the change that has taken place in the thinking about the pose of these animals so that you get something closer to this, which was a model that was prepared by the curators, by the preparators here um, in about 1990. And uh, she, Susan, um, made the uh, forelimb flat on the ground. And this is the way the thinking is about Iguanodon now. Now the one thing she didn't do was she didn't show those two lateral digits the way they are there. And so this is a somewhat different way of using the forelimb than, a, than the lighter uh, forelimb of the hadrosaur. It's been suggested that this was a defensive weapon and there's some rather lurid uh, restorations of these uh, dinosaurs uh, stabbing the throats of uh, carnivorous dinosaurs who were attacking them. So this is where we are now. We've got, this is the, 19, this is the current uh, ideas about the thinking of this, posing of this animal. But is it the end? Well, the fact that the forelimb needs to have the toes readjusted, just one example. But what else will we learn about these animals as the study of them continues? Because dinosaurs in general are fascinating, and uh, this one has got a long history of being fascinating. Well, thank you. Fantastic. Thank you, Tom. Now we have time for your questions and discussion. So could I invite the, uh, the panel members to come back? In addition to Matilda and Tom, we have a third panel member joining us. Tim Ziegler is the collection manager of Vertebrate Paleontology and worked with the Mini Mega Model Museum team to get the paleontology objects ready for display, including the whale skull fossil, which Matilda showed in her overview. So uh, welcome, Tim. Now, our, we have some great questions here uh, and uh, the first one I'd like um, to maybe put to uh, to Tom Rich. Um, what uh, what instructions would you give to a model maker today? Um, you mentioned the, um, the adjustment in the, the 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 limbs. Is there anything else that you would um, suggest if they were creating a model? Um, Right, uh, right now? Not really. I mean, this iguanodon is not my area of expertise, but uh, getting the, uh, the, the lateral toes right on the foreman would definitely be an improvement, I think, over the, what we have. But I don't know where it will go. I mean, what Dave Norman did in reviewing the Burns Sart um, collection took him about 10 years. And so you don't just have a casual comment to make. Uh, you don't 
built up an expertise about an animal by just overnight by just reading a few articles. So I haven't heard any suggestions about what else should be done about rethinking about this animal. Um, we have a question from Paul saying, uh, what is the current interpretation of the Iguanodon horn? Pretty much what the, the 1980 form is. I mean, that one correction that I would suggest for the forelimb is about it. Other than that, that's where we are at the moment. So just to clarify, that it goes on to the, like the, the, the thumb, like the, the thumb has that sort of... Yes, thumb. and also the, the, la, the, uh, the fifth digit as well. So you've got, you've got three prominent central digits, which are obviously more uh, robust than in the, the uh, hadrosaurs, the duck-billed dinosaurs. So they probably actually put that uh, limb on the ground a lot. They were, they were probably quadrupedal, much more so than the hadrosaurs. But, but uh, you know, it's like the difference among different kangaroos. We have something like 50 species of kangaroos, and they're not all alike in what they do. Well, this is, Iguanodon is not considered a hadrosaur, but it's similar. And it seems like it was probably a more robust quadrupedal form. But the two species that I mentioned, Mantelli and Bernsartensis, are different. Mantelli is much lighter than Bernsartensis, so it may have used its forelimbs quite somewhat differently. Um, now we've got a question which is about the uh, models and specifically asking a question from June saying, what materials are the models made from? Who'd like to answer that one? Is that one? I, uh, from what from what I from what I know, the the those um, the three the three models they're made of a, a plaster material around a wire frame. We know that the, around a wire frame because where those toes were missing, um, that you could see a bit of wire sticking out, and you can't leave it like that because it will corrode over time. As well, it makes the model unstable. So those early models are generally uh, plaster. That uh, 3D printed model was a, a gypsum powder that uh, was bound with a, a water-based binder and then I believe the whole lot was covered in super glue in a very professional way. Yeah. Are you going to add to that, Tim? Like... Um, no, I think that's spot on. It does sort of, the difference between the dinosaur models and the 3D print of Alfred the whale is an interesting one because you mentioned superglue in particular. And the materials that are used for these models have a big impact because there's one thing that we know about superglue in the context of museums is we don't like it very much. Uh, it's a great tool for bonding things together very quickly, but it doesn't last very long. In 10, 15 years, it will be behaving in a very different way to how it is now and it may become brittle and break down and you know stop being useful so that 3d print of alfred's skull is not uh in any likelihood going to be around for nearly as long as say the original waterhouse hawkins model of the crystal palace iguanodon Yes, yeah, so we're lucky in a way that we do still have that um, Crystal Palace model. I mean, it's lasted very well. Um, we have another question actually relating to the 3D printed um, Alfred's skull uh, from Dan. Dan asks, does the visible joint indicate that it's designed to be later disassembled and reassembled with improved information? Uh, would the join have been finished to be invisible otherwise? Um, oh, I believe it might be in two parts simply because of the size of the printer that was used. Would that be right, Tim? Like, um, so that then it, the two parts can be joined, so printed separately and joined together. I don't know about whether you plan to take them apart again. <laughs> yeah, that, that's right. So the model was printed in two sections, um, although the data set that it was produced from is one continuous piece. Um, the 3D model was sliced up if you like because that's the size of the container uh, in that kind of 3d printer which is um, uh, which was used at monash university to make that model um, they could be separated again 
but there wouldn't be much purpose in that. So we produced that model in particular as, if you like, a quick and dirty way to get a good representation of that skull in its complete form when the initial scientific paper describing that animal was released. Um, the, the pace that things were working at at the time was such that at the time that we uh, 3D printed that skull, uh, as Kate mentioned or Matilda mentioned earlier, the actual fragments of it hadn't yet been repaired together. So they were actually scanned, that skull was scanned in, uh, I'd say about 15 to 20 pieces. Um, and each one of those was digitally joined back together to make the continuous shape. Now, since that time, the skull has been repaired. Um, and so it sits more or less as a solid piece. And the fact that you can sit them side by side is um, a pretty good testament to the quality of the data and the model that was used to make that Print. Thank you, Tim. Now, there's a quick there's a quick question about where that um, uh, fossil was found, the fossil whale. Ah, good one. Um, that fossil came halfway around the world to get to Melbourne Museum, and it was collected on the northwest coast of the USA in uh, Washington State. Now, the reason that's relevant to a museum in Melbourne is all the way around the edges. We're talking about the Pacific Basin. And so there are really interesting things you can understand about the evolution of, you know, a group of animals that lives in the ocean across that whole basin. Um, there are extensive exposures of similarly aged rock in Southern Australia um, that make it really interesting to compare the different kinds of animals that in particular were living in, say, the Northern Hemisphere, where that whale came from, and the Southern Hemisphere here in Australia. Um, the reason that it came to Australia in particular was the relationship between the collector of that fossil, um, Mr. James Geddet, uh, who, along with his wife, Gail Geddet, have collected hundreds, if not more, um, uh, marine fossils from that area of northwest USA. He has a very good relationship with our other senior curator of paleontology at Melbourne Museum, Eric Fitzgerald, um, with whom he's collaborated quite a bit on preparing and then publicising, you know, doing research on and sharing the nature of these animals from the fossil record. So Jim donated that specimen to Museums Victoria for the state collection because, in his judgment, it was a great place to put it. Great. Thank you, Tim. Um, we have um, some young um, people who have got some good questions, so we might go to them next because you just never quite know when bedtime is. We've got one from Leon, age six, and he wants to know how many iguanodons were found in the coal mine. Tom, About 35. There were about 35 individuals. Now, the coal mine was abandoned and flooded. So uh, the Germans wanted to go back in and collect when they occupied Belgium in the First World War. But it, they didn't. It was by that time, it was so precarious, they couldn't do it. They, they tried, but they couldn't do it. And it's been abandoned since then. So that's a, they got as many as they're going to get. Because getting get, going underground, uh, more than 200 meters and pumping out a coal mine and making it stable is quite a job and so um, and quite expensive so nobody's going to do it unless one day is really interested and got a big fat checkbook. Great thank you Tom uh, and we have another one from Audrey um, who's five and she would like to know do you have a model of the T-Rex? We don't have a model here of T-Rex on the, um, the uh, Walking with Dinosaurs part of our exhibition, we have a uh, cast of a skeleton of an animal that was first named T-Rex, and then a year later was called another genus. It's from Mongolia. It's a, a cast of a Russian specimen that they collected in the 1940s. And um, we fortunately 
were able to mold and cast that fossil when it was here in the 1990s. That's called, called Tarbosaurus batari, which um, means uh, basically a T-Rex hero, batar meaning hero. So yeah, thank you, Audrey, for your, your question. Um, now we're going to um, have a look at some other questions here. Um, how can you get involved in paleontology at the museum? How can you get involved with paleontology at the museum? Well, um, people who've worked with me in the past have basically volunteered on digs that I've organized when I've uh, put out an invitation and they find out about it one way or another. I'm not sure how they all do it, but over the 40 years that I've been uh, collecting dinosaurs along the coast here, we've had 700 people as volunteers. And um, there is a, um, a site called Dinosaur Dreaming. And if you got onto that, you might uh, get a clue as to how to uh, join the friends of Dinosaur Dreaming. And um, we work with the, the members of that. We have an annual meeting, which we hope we'll have this year, um, to explain what we're doing and uh, encourage them to participate in one way or another. Fantastic. Now we've got a few questions that relate to how the iguanodon uh, looks in terms of its um, outer body covering, whether it should have feathers or perhaps, um, you know, some other features on its skin. Would you like to comment about that at all? Well, the impressions of the skin that have been recovered look sort of like a golf ball. They don't have the feathers that are known on some groups of dinosaurs, but not, not the iguanodons and not the uh, duckbill dinosaurs, which look similar to them. So um, they probably look somewhat like a lizard uh, externally. Now what their color was, we don't have really much of a clue, but uh, in doing a restoration, the, what's generally done, trying to make a, an image of a, a guanodon or a duckbill dinosaur in their natural habitat is you look at animals that are living in similar habitats today, particularly reptiles, and use that as a guide. That's the best we can do in most cases. Great, right, thank you. Um, now, Zena has a question here. It's quite specific. There's a carnivorous dinosaur called Nanuquasaur, uh, and it's a species of T-Rex that lived in the Arctic. Can we find a preserved one and make a very realistic model? Is her question. What was the first dinosaur he mentioned? Uh, it's Nanuquasaur. Nanuquasaur. I'm not familiar with that one. Is that from China? I don't know. Uh, it lived in the Arctic apparently a carnivorous dinosaur that lived in the arctic we might we might take it's that where? question on. it lives uh, where it lived in the arctic so that's what well, the, in the, the arctic, oh, the arctic. The, the okay well uh, the um in northern alaska um they do have uh, a t-rex like dinosaur so basically you would probably restore it just like t-rex from lower latitude there's a particularly small one uh, that's been described from there, but uh, there's no reason to think that the larger ones weren't up there. But the, uh, the Arctic dinosaurs are uh, fairly diverse and they look much like the ones from lower latitudes. Okay, we have Paul asking, he recently visited Winton, Richmond and Hugendale and um, the number of Australian dinosaurs seems remarkable. What access does Museum Victoria have to these finds and what inputs do you have in shaping the interpretation of these finds? Well, the uh, Australian Age of Dinosaurs is uh, basically a separate operation. We've had work with them. We actually helped them restore some fossil footprints about a year ago. A group of us went up there. Um, it's run by a fellow by the name of David Elliott, who's a, um, basically a landowner who, on whose land a dinosaur was discovered, and he got hooked on the idea, and so did his wife, Judy. And so they set up the Australian Age of Dinosaurs Museum. And their principal paleontologist is Steve Poropat, 
who's uh, associated not only with the Australian age of dinosaurs, but also Swinburne. And Steve sort of goes between the two organizations. And he would, uh, he would be up there about now, except for the uh, COVID-19 um, interference. But he's written a number of papers about the, uh, particularly the sauropod dinosaurs from there, the, the largest dinosaurs. And um, that's his specialty. But anything that turns up, he will be interested in. So, um, but that's about it. That's basically the center of our cooperation. Now, where I, I have worked with them is trying to find little things, mammals in particular, up there. They should be there. We never found one yet, but we've tried. And hopefully we'll be able to try again when uh, it becomes possible to travel between the different states. And uh, we'll just see how it goes. But the fossils that I'm really interested in are the mammals that live with the dinosaurs. Well, it took me 23 years here in Victoria to find the first specimen. So one has to be patient in this business. We started finding dinosaurs a lot sooner than we find these little mammals. So maybe the same thing will be true up in Queensland. We'll keep trying and eventually we'll, they'll turn it up. Fantastic. Um, Leela asks, uh, do paleontologists have any sense of how many species might have remained undiscovered due to mining or other developments? Are there protocols that have to be followed to prevent dinosaur bones from accidentally being destroyed? Well, the best thing is an alert person working on a, in an area, people who are doing excavations for one reason or another. That's, and it, it's really, it has to do with the fortune you have of the nature of the people who actually first encounter the fossils. Now we have a classic situation here in Victoria. In 1961, they were widening the South Gippsland Highway and some very alert uh, road workers collected a large fish. This was brought to the attention of the local newspaper, which was read by a geologist by the name of Jim Bowler. And that led to both um, Melbourne University and later Monash University and the museum getting involved with fossils there. So a lot of it depends on the people who find them initially alerting museums to the existence of these fossils. And we're very dependent on this sort of thing happening to, to find fossils, particularly in places you don't expect to find them initially anyway. And once in a while that happens. And this road work uh, was very essential. And they're actually widening that section of road again. And uh, the um, Vic Roads is uh, being very cooperative to let us look at the site as they're excavating it. And they've even hired a paleontologist to visit the site from time to time just to check out to make sure that there isn't something happening there. And so who knows, in six months, a year, we might have another fossil site down in, uh, down in uh, South Gippsland. But it just depends on alert people being very helpful and cooperative. And oftentimes the people who find these things are very interested. And so they really augment our efforts to find fossils. Right. Um, does Museum Victoria have any Australoven Australovenator fossils or models in the works? We don't have any Australovenator fossils or models per se, but we have one bone, an ankle bone, that was found in 1978, which looks like it could just, just about drop in to the foot of an Australovenator. We also have a claw that looks just like Australovenator. We haven't got a whole skeleton or close to it like they'd have in Queensland, but our specimens can just about be dropped into their skeletons. So yeah, we have something that was, there was a large carnivore here like Australovenator. And uh, we have even found some footprints recently of what could be that dinosaur. Thank you, Tom. Um, we have another interesting question about uh, from Mark, have dinosaur bones been found in all parts of the world, even Antarctica? Yes. How's that? <laughs> Good short answer. <laughs> Antarctic, Antarctic dinosaurs were first found in, in the 1990s. 
and a number of them have been found since. And um, my wife and I have even had the privilege of describing one bone from there. A, uh, just one little tiny bone, just enough to tell us we had a, a duck-billed dinosaur on the Antarctic Peninsula. They're all found on the Antarctic Peninsula, which juts up towards uh, South America, except some much older ones in the Trans-Antarctic Mountains, which um, are about mm, 200 million years old. They're almost as old as dinosaurs get. So you've got these two areas, the one that the peninsula jumps up to South America, and then the Trans-Antarctic Mountains, which is right in the heart of Antarctica. I mean, the sites in the Trans-Antarctic Mountains are only about four or 500 kilometers from the South Pole. Thank you. Now, I'm, what, I'm hoping Patrick is still there. He's seven and he would love to know what the current theory of the use of the iguanodon's thumb is. Or do we, do we know? Well, as I said in that talk, there's some lurid uh, restorations of the iguanodon stabbing a uh, carnivorous dinosaur in the throat with his thumb. Eh, that's probably as good a guess as any. <laughs> So oh, um, if Patrick's got a good theory about it, um, can he write into the museum and, and tell us what he thinks? That's fine. I look forward to reading it. Great. Um, look, we've got so many lovely questions here. I think we have time maybe for one or two more. So I do apologize if we haven't got to your question. Um, there's one from Deborah, and she says, uh, are there other examples of models that misrepresent known reality in the museum's collection, deliberately or accidentally? Not that I'm aware of. Tim, uh, Matilda, do you know of any uh, models that deliberately kind of stretch the, uh, the truth? I said, yeah. Yeah. I, I, I'm just, I, I immediately thought of uh, Tim when you showed us Megalosaurus. I think I remember, yeah, showing Matilda a few of the different models that we have replicas and reconstructions of different extinct animals uh, in the paleontology collection when the mini mega model museum project kicked off. And I think the important thing that we, when we had a conversation about it, the important thing that came out was that these models of, if you like, the wrong iguanodon, they're wrong today. They weren't necessarily wrong at the time. And that maybe that sort of makes your head turn around. But in every instance, the people creating the knowledge and then trying to create these models to share that knowledge with others, they were using what information they had available to them. And the joy of it is that the information has kept growing and growing with, as Tom said earlier, interested people, you know, wanting to keep thinking about these questions keep thinking about these animals, trying to understand what their place was in the world at the time. Um, we think a lot more about it probably now than uh, many times in the past. And we've got lots more techniques available to us to investigate um, many of the details of these animals. So, okay, in the past you see something pointy, you think of an iguana, you can put it on the nose, it's a best guess for the time. Today, um, the thumb spike, if you like, of iguanodon is something that's been studied by X-Rain, making uh, internal models, looking at how the actual bone structure inside those bones is, um, has grown and seeing that they are quite well adapted to taking a lot of force. So it's something that changes... Um, what we we're talking about earlier, what we think they might have been doing with them. So if someone like Patrick wants to make a pretty cool model of an iguanodon with its thumb out like a weapon, well, now the science is behind it. In the past, it wasn't there. Thank you, Tim. A last chance for a last comment, Tom, on, on that. Science is never done, I guess, is the, is the bottom line. There's all... Yes, science is never done. It's, you put up a hypothesis and uh, you will modify it as things change, as information comes in, as, and also as you reanalyze the information you have. I mean, this is what, 
when Norman was looking at uh, Iguanodon bernsardensis, there wasn't more material that wasn't available to Dolo. It's just that he was taking some work that had been done on hadrosaurs and then applying it to the Iguanodon. And that's why he came up with the restoration he did. But yeah, other things will happen. And imaginative people will have insights to look at things in a different way. And that's where it makes science interesting. It's not all over. Fantastic. Uh, thank you. I think that's a very uh, good and positive note to end on. The science is not done. It's not all over. If you have an, a passion to dis explore and discover, if you've got curiosity, there's still things to find out there. Um, so thank you very much to our speakers tonight. Uh, Matilda, Tom, Tim, thank you for joining us. And also to our audience, your wonderful questions, very much appreciated. 